Well, government intends to leverage the current discovery of mineral resources in parts of the country for the manufacturing of solar batteries. Picture this. A single, unassuming, grayish rock, no bigger than your phone, plucked from the rich, red Ghanaian soil just last year. Now, imagine that little rock is worth more than an ounce of gold. Crazy, right? Now, multiply that one rock by a million. And you've got yourself a trillion dollar secret, lying hidden in plain sight, right there beneath the cocoa farms outside Kibi. That secret, my friends, is tantalum. It's the magic dust powering every smartphone in your pocket, every Tesla battery humming down the road, every fighter jet radar sweeping the skies. Ghana just stumbled upon one of the richest tantalum belts on Earth. So here's the million dollar question. Will this discovery pave the way for Dubai-style hospitals in every village along the Winba Road? Or are we about to witness yet another chapter in that old, heartbreaking African story, where the treasure sails away on ships while the people are left behind, still struggling? Today, we're laying out the numbers, the history, and the tough choices on the table. By the end of this, you'll be ready to decide for yourself. Is this a blessing or a curse? Last March, something incredible happened. Geologists from the Ghana Geological Survey Authority cracked open some pegmatite cores drilled near Buwads. And there it was, the unmistakable, shimmering flakes of columbite tantalite. The assays came back, showing an average of 260 parts per million papum, tantalum. Some zones even spiked to a staggering 773 pum. Now, even conservative estimates already suggest over 50,000 tons of contained tantalum metal just in the Kibi Winneba belt alone. What does that mean in real money? At today's price, roughly $400 per kilogram of contained tantalum pentoxide, we're talking north of $20 billion. That's $20 billion just sitting there, in one stretch of forest, barely 80 kilometers from Accra. To put that in perspective, Ghana's entire gold export revenue last year was 7 billion. One discovery, tripling the value of our flagship industry? No wonder headlines are screaming game changer. This isn't just a find, it's a monumental shift, a potential economic earthquake. Tantalum's superpower, it's all about the microscopic. It forms the thinnest, most stable oxide layer of any known metal. This means we get the smallest, most reliable capacitors for your phone's motherboard. Seriously, take away tantalum, and your sleek iPhone instantly becomes a brick the size of a 1998 Nokia. Take it away from other applications, and heart defibrillators fail. Satellites go blind, wind turbine inverters catch fire. It's that critical. The United States isn't playing around. They've listed tantalum as one of just five minerals critical to national security. China? They're stockpiling it. The EU? They call it strategic raw material number one. The translation is simple. Whoever controls clean, conflict-free tantalum holds serious leverage in every single tech supply chain. Ghana, it seems, just walked into that global poker game holding a royal flush. This isn't just about money. It's about geopolitical power and technological independence. Let's follow the optimistic path, shall we? Imagine a Ghana where the government smartly keeps royalties at 10%, strictly enforces local beneficiation plants, and insists that miners hire Ghanaian metallurgists, trained right here in our universities like Takwa and KNUST. The idea is to add value right here at home, turn the raw ore into powder, that powder into capacitors, and those capacitors into consumer electronics. This way, we capture the full $4,000 per kilogram finished product margin instead of just the meager $400 raw ore price. We build new roads, lay fiber optic cables, and establish state-of-the-art 150 ton per hour processing plants in a special tantalum economic zone. The Minerals Commission estimates this approach could create 35,000 direct jobs and another 100,000 indirect ones within a decade. 
Tax revenue would flow directly into the national treasury, just as oil receipts plateau, cushioning the CD and funding our free senior high school program without racking up new debt. Rural towns like Achium Apapam could transform into modern agro-mining hubs, with cocoa farmers doubling their income by leasing small plots to licensed miners. Ghana could finally break free from the classic dependence on just cocoa and gold. That, my friends, is the dream our ministers are selling on the evening talk shows. It's a vision of self-sufficiency and widespread prosperity. Now, let's flip that coin. In 2022, the Democratic Republic of Congo exported 1,100 tons of tantalum. Yet, they ranked a dismal 179th on the UN Human Development Index. Sierra Leone shipped iron ore worth $6 billion between 2011 and 2015, but maternal mortality remained stubbornly flat and youth unemployment actually rose. Ghana itself has tasted this sour side before. Gold has been mined here since the 1400s, but Obuasi's streets still flood when it rains because proper drainage was never part of the colonial bargain. Tantalum carries three extra chilling risks. First, its incredibly thin worldwide supply chain means prices can swing wildly $400 today, $150 tomorrow. Governments that borrow against future royalties can drown in debt fast. Second, because individual tantalum grains are tiny and easily bagged, artisanal miners often crush ore at night using mercury and, tragically, child labor. It's a scene already documented along the Pra River. Third, foreign buyers, often with briefcases full of cash, can easily bypass official export channels through the same porous borders that allow gold smuggling. If Accra signs sweetheart agreements with vague infrastructure for mineral swaps, tantalum could become yet another textbook example of the resource curse, enriching a handful of politically connected middlemen while communities watch their water turn rusty. We've seen this movie before, and it rarely ends well for the people. So who exactly is in the room, vying for a piece of this action? Australian junior mining companies have already staked 1,200 square kilometers of licenses through local subsidiaries. A Chinese state entity has shipped bulk samples to Guangdong. And at least two Luxembourg-based special purpose vehicles are actively hunting for off-take deals. Each of these players brings financing, technology, and offshore processing capacity, precisely what Ghana currently lacks. Yet, each also demands tax holidays, duty-free fuel, and the right to repatriate profits in dollars. On the other side sits Ghana's Minerals Commission, underfunded and staffed by fewer than 60 technical officers, somehow tasked with overseeing 200,000 artisanal miners nationwide. Parliament has read the 2015 Minerals Development Fund Act, sure, but royalty still managed to reach districts 12 months late. Civil society groups are pushing for a sovereign wealth fund. Chiefs want 30% of surface rents, and the youth, they want jobs yesterday. The delicate balance of power here hinges on one thin layer, the strength of Ghana's institutions under immense pressure. Can they hold the line? Tantalum mining, unlike large-scale gold operations, isn't typically a cyanide bath. But don't let that fool you, it still scars landscapes. The pegmatite bodies sit within weathered laterite. Open pit benches chew through precious topsoil, and tailings ponds can leak heavy metals into the Burum River which is already stressed by illegal gold mining. Consider this. One 150 ton per hour processing plant needs 1.8 million liters of water daily. Multiply that by 10 proposed plants, and you're rivaling the water demand of an entire city like Koforidua. Yet, the Environmental Protection Authority has approved only two full environmental impact statements so far. Climate change adds another layer of complexity. Erratic rainfall means either devastating floods that wash salt into cocoa farms or severe droughts that leave processing plants idle. If reclamation bonds are set too low, 
Ghanaian taxpayers will be f footing the cleanup bill long after the last kilo of tantalum sails off to Shanghai. The environmental cost could be immense and long-lasting. Botswana, a shining example, rewrote the African playbook. They renegotiated every diamond contract within 10 years of independence, insisting De Beers build sorting offices right there in Gaborone, and channeling a remarkable 75% of diamond rents into public education. Ghana actually has the legal tools already. The 2019 Minerals and Mining Act allows the government to take up to a 20% free carried interest in every mine. Our 2020 AMV policy demands local content and the Anti-Corruption Action Plan mandates contract disclosure. This tantalum moment will be the ultimate test. Are these laws merely museum pieces, gathering dust, or are they working tools ready to be wielded? Here's a simple benchmark. Publish every exploitation permit online within 30 days of signing. Make sure it includes the royalty rate, the local employment quota, and the environmental bond amount. If that single transparent step happens, the curse loses 50% of its sting overnight. It's about accountability, plain and simple. Here's the uncomfortable truth. Tantalum prices tend to spike when geopolitical tensions rise. If Ukraine, Taiwan, or the Red Sea hiccups, buyers in Seoul and Detroit will gladly pay premiums for a stable supply. That window, perhaps 18 months, if we're lucky, gives Ghana incredible leverage to negotiate much better terms. Wait too long, and a price crash or the discovery of a new Brazilian deposit could steal our microphone. Small-scale miners are already digging. Without formalization, they'll entrench illicit channels that no minister will dare dismantle later. In other words, Accra needs to choose its fork in the road, and quickly, before that road itself disappears into the jungle. Time is not on our side. Pause. Seriously. Take a moment. Which side are you leading towards so far? Blessing or curse? Drop a quick B or C in the comments below. And after the next segment, see if your mind changes. Oh, and don't forget to hit that share button so your circle can weigh in. This conversation belongs to everyone who owns a phone powered by Ghanaian Rock. Let's get practical, shall we? First, split royalties 50-50 between the National Treasury and local development funds, and make sure they're released quarterly not just once a year. Second, require every company to build a 10 ton per day mechanical processing line right here in Ghana before their export licenses get renewed. Simple gravity separators cost under $5 million. That's cheaper than a downtown Accra hotel. Third, peg tax reductions to verify training hours. For every Ghanaian technician certified to international standards, cut corporate tax by 0.25%, up to a ceiling of 5%. Fourth, empower district assemblies to negotiate direct community agreements. We're talking school roofs, clinic beds, irrigation dams, funded by 1% of gross sales, mirroring Papua New Guinea's successful model. Finally, deploy satellite-based all tracking tags so every sack of concentrate carries a QR code. Buyers in Berlin could scan it and instantly see the mine origin, the royalty paid, and the carbon score. Together, these steps convert raw luck into shared prosperity without needing to reinvent the wheel. It's about smart, actionable policies. Ghana can also play geopolitics and play it well. The US and EU are desperate for non-Chinese, non-conflict supply of critical minerals. Accra could offer a tantalum compact. Sign transparent, long-term contracts with America and Europe, guaranteeing 25% of our output at capped but fair prices. In exchange, infrastructure loans at a mere 2% interest. Japan's JOCA is already building traffic interchanges in Accra. Let's extend that logic to rail spurs and solar microgrids in our mining districts. By branding itself as the first African nation to deliver audited, child-labor-free, low-carbon tantalum, 
Ghana could command a 5 to 10% premium on global markets. That soft power label is worth just as much as the ore itself. It's about strategic positioning on the world stage. Put yourself in the president's chair for a moment. You've got two main options. Option A, rush to sign, pocket some quick bonuses, and risk ending up like Nauru. Once the richest per capita island in the world, now broke after its phosphate ran out. Or option B, hold firm, tolerate a slower ramp up, invest heavily in our institutions, and become the Norway of critical minerals. The arithmetic is crystal clear. Every extra year spent strengthening local capacity adds roughly $1.2 billion in retained value over the life of the belt. But here's the rub. Election cycles are just four years, and voters want clinics and jobs today. Hence the agonizing dilemma. Short-term popularity versus long-term transformative change. History, my friends, never forgives the wrong pick. We're heading to the wrap, but your voice still absolutely matters. If you want deeper dives on how Botswana negotiated with De Beers, or how Rwanda cleaned up its Colton image, smash that subscribe button and comment deep dive so the algorithm knows you're serious about African resource stories done right. So, blessing or curse? The rock beneath Kibi, honestly, doesn't care. It just waits. The decision rests with Ghana's institutions, its chiefs, its miners, its entrepreneurs, and yes, even YouTube watchers like you. If Accra chooses transparent contracts, insists on local refining, and demands environmental cash up front. Tantalum could fund the best schools, hospitals, and green tech startups on the entire continent. But if Accra repeats the old shortcuts, if we fall back into familiar patterns, then five years from now, we'll be filming another documentary among abandoned pits, asking why the phones in our pockets still carry Ghanaian atoms, but left Ghanaian children thirsty. The story, my friends, is unwritten. The pen is in Ghanaian hands today and in global consumer choices tomorrow. Drop your final verdict below. B for blessing, C for curse. Share this video with one friend who still thinks rocks are just rocks. And remember, every swipe, every battery, every tweet touches a supply chain that now starts in red Ghanaian soil. Make that knowledge count.